Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Hot Gamers Only. I'm your host Ethan and I'm joined, as always, most of the time by my co-host with the co-most. It's Hunter. How are you doing, Hunter? Oh, I'm doing swell. Uh, you ready to talk Final Fantasy VII? Finally, I've kept you oh, waiting. Long I enough. was born ready. It's only been a month. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but yes, this oh, is okay. our Final Fantasy VII Remake spoiler cast. If you didn't catch our last spoiler cast that came out last week, this is a all what am I trying to say? There's no holds barred kind of zone. We're going to spoil everything that there is to do with Final Fantasy VII Remake, which means have you not played the game? Get the fuck out then, because this isn't for you. We have our first impressions. Hunter basically gave his impressions of the whole game without spoilers on previous episodes of Hot Games Only. I think it was episodes 3, 4, and 5, if I remember correctly. I, think I might it, be wrong. I think it would have been 4 and 5. Three or it was, was 4 and was 5. Yeah, 3 was an evil review. RE2, wasn't it? No, RE3. Three. But, but mine's going. Yeah. Sorry, I've recorded. For those who are, are not in the loop, I've recorded three of these things in three days now. I've just, I've done, I did the P5 spoiler cast, then we did a regular episode, and now we're doing this, so if I'm a bit out of it, you know why, but yeah. yeah. Um, Hunter's given his impressions on the game without spoilers in previous episodes, so if you want to go and listen to that, this is full of spoilers. We're going to be talking everything from what the hell that ending was to um, everything else to do with FF7 Remake. Um, I will quickly so yeah. say before anyone who hasn't played the game clicks off for fear of spoilers that I do recommend that you go and play it. And oh, that's a good play point. Play it now too. Don't wait for the rest of them to come out. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, go play it; it's really good. Like I said with P Five uh, Royal, it, do yourself a favor and go and play it. Um, two of the best games of this year have, uh, came out within two weeks. So if you missed one of them, go and play them. They're really great. Um, I thought we'd start like we started with the P Five Royal spoiler cast and basically give a bit bit of backstory to what we have what our history is with fan fantasy and the remake in general um so i'll start because mine's less interesting than you (laughs) um i've never played a final fantasy game before final fantasy 7 remake this is my first final fantasy game um and i picked up the remake solely because if e3 didn't sell it to me the demo surely did because the demo was really great so i'll let you um give your words on all right so I grew up with the Final Fantasy series. We had all of all three of the PlayStation 1 games when I was younger. We had Final Fantasy 10 and, you know, my actual like experience with them as an adult is varied. Like I've played like the ones I've played as a thinking person have been 9, 6, 10, 15, some of 12, and so on and so forth. I have not played all of the original version of 7, but I've played up through Midgar, so it helps for comparisons to the remake here. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So there you go, you got someone completely new to Final Fantasy 7, and someone that's played enough of Final Fantasy 7 to kind of give a comparison here, at least to the point that we're up to in the remake, yeah. where the first part ends. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, where do you want to start, Hunter? I'll let you pick um, where we start. I don't know. Do you want to just skip to the end and explain? Work our way back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we can do. Let's go for it. You need, but you, you've got a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everything was going pretty all right up until like the last two chapters is when things started getting bonkers. Um. Yeah. It was up until it was perfectly fine up until. Uh, Red 13 was a bit of a weird inclusion, which is... Oh, he was, was in the original of, game, don't He was worry. in the original he from, was, yeah. He was weird and stuff. But just, I feel like just, he had to come in at this point, obviously, because this is where he came in in the original story, but it kind of felt very weird in the last, what is essentially the last two hours of the game, three hours of the game, to just throw in this animal that talks, just randomly. <laughs> <laughs> um... So that's when it kind of, that whole section with Sephiroth coming back and all of that, that's probably when stuff really started to hit the fan. Oh, yeah. In terms so, of the plot. Yeah, that's when things started getting crazy. Uh, they really had me going there when Sephiroth like appeared and stabbed Barrett because that didn't happen in the original game. I was like, oh man, the stone's on this game. <laughs> Killing Barrett, yeah. Yeah, Imagine. but then, you know, the Dementors came and undid it as is what they described was their purpose yeah and the, i can't even remember what the name 
Whispers is what they're called. The, yeah, the Whispers of Destiny or Fate or whatever. Yeah. Um, Basically, their whole thing seemed to be keeping things on track as they happened originally. Yeah, that's what's interesting is basically the way that they're described uh, by Red 13 and just in the end of the game in general was they this entire time the reason that they've been appearing is because they've been trying to keep his, like they've been trying to keep everything in set on a set course essentially. Um there's a way that things are supposed to happen and the whispers are basically trying to make sure that that happens. So for example, in the end, when not only does uh, the president of uh, Shinra get stabbed, but then also Barrett, the ghosts bring Barrett back to life, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. President um, and leave Shinra in the dust. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so that was fascinating. Um, I think that since it escalated into like fighting the catalyst for those whispers and the driving fate behind them that they should and i hope that they are not going to appear in the later games i doubt it i think the my thoughts on the ending were essentially with them the final fight is as i was saying to you earlier it's really hard to try and explain to people who haven't played the game um you're essentially fighting destiny slash fate what which is what these whispers are trying to essentially keep you tied to uh, is the whole idea of the final boss with the light walking into the light and dealing with the whispers so yeah. you'd assume that they're um gone now um, yeah. i think what's more interesting is what are the repercussions of this going to be for the future and that's the yeah that's the question isn't it like why did sephiroth do that and what I believe that the answer to that is that it's like either a version of Sephiroth from the future or just an alternate version of Sephiroth altogether came back to this version of the world to kind of defy or set them up to defy fate so that it could create a scenario where he could win. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if it keeps, if the whispers were to keep everything tied to how they should be, then he would lose clearly yeah so long. it's interesting it's gonna be really interesting to see and i like everyone's already up in arms about all their theories and their speculation about what's gonna happen next is namora has gone out of his way to say that the game they don't intend to drastically change the story of seven as a whole i think he's been on record as saying that but then at the same time which is interesting because this ending scene because the whole end of the game seems like oh we're not beholden to the first version of the story we're gonna do whatever we want i do think it's i i kind of think that's interesting i'd find it hilarious if the whole obviously we've for the longest time we've known that this first part is just called final fantasy 7 remake yeah. Um and it's not the whole game. I think it would be very funny if the reasoning behind that would have been all along that this is the only part of the game that kind of closely <laughs> ties into the original story and the rest of it is moving on and doing different things. Like I think they're going to follow a similar story. I think story they're going to hit the same kind of notes, but they might do things differently as far as mm. achieving that. Yeah. But, I mean uh, the big question will be is yeah, how closely do they stay? And if the if they decide... what My big interesting thing is, what are they going to do with that spoiler? The uh, Final yeah. Fantasy VII spoiler. Yeah, the spoiler um, that you probably know about, but, you know. Because in- you'd think that they'd keep it, but with all this changing fate and changing destiny and all of this, and even Nomura having the um, audacity to have... Uh, Aerith even say in her little special cutscene in the don't fall in love with me don't get attached to me um kind of basically saying to people that haven't played the game before <laughs> don't get attached yeah. seriously you might regret this there's um, there's another reason in character for that that i might be able to explain to you now that you've seen oh go end. for it all right so you know the dude with the black hair at the end uh yeah zach well yeah, you see zach. he was cloud's buddy that in mm-hmm. the original version of events is dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was like, he was the person that Eris was talking about when they were uh, in the playground. And she was like the first person I loved or whatever. And Cloud like got the headache flash when she was about to say his name. That was who she was. Oh, it's him. About. Yeah. 
So they know each other. Yeah. Well, now Zach, one, yeah. or Zach and Eris know each other, and then um, as far as Cloud is aware, he's dead. Yeah, and this is the, this is another thing that's interesting, is the flashbacks of Zach at the end of the game were really interesting, to say the least. Like, they were very weird. Yeah, that, like, was the, kind of that was the part where I was like, okay, so all of the other times that they've like shown little glimpses of things that happen in the original game or make other references to the continuity could be written off as like strange foreshadowing. The little bit that focused on Zach, I was like, okay, no one would know. No one new to this would know who he is. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, weird, but I think that's what the whole thing is like. I, from what I read, it was like, I knew that that was a bit different with the whole flashback with when it's raining and you see, you see, not only do you see Zach with cloud, but it's as if they both got out of there. Yeah. Heart like Scott free in a way. Yeah. Like, which to me suggests either is this some alternate timeline stuff coming in? Is this is this what they mean when they say things are changing? I is it... I think that that was kind of I think it's more thematic than it is literal, as far as showing Zach and like you know how they were walking past each other and they like that bit like right at the end where like it, the group was leaving Midgar as like Zach and Cloud and the other yeah. version where like, they like passed each other. I think that was just kind of an illustration that they did change things, although it may not be like their specific, like as far as the group of characters and versions of them that we know, I think Zach is still dead, but Mm. they made like a scenario where it was possible for him to survive. I think is what that means. This is what's going to be great about this ending and discussing this for like the next couple of years is, (laughs) and I mean it when I say years, because no one likes to take his sweet time with things is it's gonna. It's it's in a really interesting place where it's not as what I. If you were to tell me before remake what I what everyone would think of the ending, I thought it would very much get to a specific place where, oh yeah, this is where I'd expect it to end. And on that note, that's it. We're just moving on. It's like okay, yeah, we know where the get the story is going next. Where Namora's given us like this little glimmer, this little light at the end of the tunnel, that is, um, oh, this might change. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how substantial this whisper thing has actually been to the story until Nomura decides to share it with us. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting because I'm not particularly opposed to them making changes to the story in any shape. Neither am I, I, to be honest. Like like I said, I didn't play all of Seven, so it's not like this sacred thing to me. If they could... The game's still there as well, technically. Yeah, it's still there. You could still go and play it if you wanted. Mm-hmm. So and it's if... called it's called remake as well. It's not like it's going back to the it's going back to it and saying, hey, if we were to do this now, what would we do to it? And they were like, oh, let's expand Midgar because Midgar's really interesting, and you only see for like five hours of it yeah. in the original game. That was a and lot of people's favorite part of the original game. Even it's a really good part of the game. Yeah. I really enjoyed Midgar. We'll have to talk about Midgar specifically in a bit. But um... yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Ah. Um, but no, I think this in, this ending is going to be really interesting. Um, I said it to you uh, in private, and we've had this conversation before. It'll definitely be the second part of the remake is definitely when we'll find out what this is going to be. Yeah, I, I feel like, like as soon as we have the second part in our hands and we've played it, we'll know how long this is going to take to wrap up. We're going to know how where it's going, what changes are kind of being made. Yeah, I um, think that part two will be rather indicative of how the rest of it will go, which is, it seems a little weird to say that that after playing part one, but, you know, what can you do? It's going to, like you say, we don't know how um, it's going to go, because there's, there's two methods that they could go, which I... The original, obviously, this is this is the point in the game for those who haven't played the original. I've done enough research that I can say this, where it kind of expands. This is where the game, when you leave Midgar, that's when it kind of becomes more of a Final Fantasy game, like open. Yeah, it it kind opens of the up game a lot. opens up. <laughs> Whereas I don't personally see that happening a remake because the way that they've been doing it is very linear journey, and if they're making this in parts, then they can't have parts that aren't going to appear ages away uh, in the second part if they don't have any purpose to it in a way so i feel like it's going to be really interesting i think it's going to be more of a linear experience 
which might be why they decided to do the whole changing of fate thing is so that they can make a more structural story in a way yeah which i'm not super bothered by because like yeah final fantasy games early on would always open up and you could go wherever you want but you always pretty much got signposted to where you should go and going mm-hmm. elsewhere aside from maybe a little bonus scene here and there didn't really serve a whole lot yeah i got you i got you yeah um so yeah the ending is very confusing i think that's the one thing if i had to say one thing this game did a really great job of bringing people that are new to the world of final fantasy in general not even just new to final fantasy 7 but just new to final fantasy they did a really great job of appealing to that audience they knew that hey if any final fantasy game is going to bring in a new audience it's going to be remake so let's let's do that justice let's make it as appealing as possible and they did and i think the only thing that they may have faltered on in that regard is having this ending that is so (laughs) that's so confusing to the players that haven't know nothing about final fantasy and it gives those yes it gives those original fans some little tidbits and some little hints and clues into where it may possibly be going but it kind of just for me personally before i looked everything up it kind of just left me with a this is weird what the hell's gone on? I don't really know. I'm very confused. See, so this is hard to say since I am aware of the original game, but I feel like the rest of it was still strong enough to be where where it was weird, but I was still... Like, this is the difference between... Uh, let's just compare Nomura projects here. The characters and story in this game were good enough for me to be along for the ride if mm-hmm. it gets stupid now, as opposed to where, you know, Kingdom Hearts is just dumb and... <laughs> I don't care about the story or characters, and I'm just kind of there at a kind of point. I mean, we that. should we should talk about the characters in Final Fantasy VII, because if you ask me what is my favorite part and what do I personally think is the strongest part of the remake, it's the characters. I um, concur. They nailed it. They Every single character. There wasn't a single character where I was like, that's off, or that's a bit... I am not. don't really agree with it. They nailed it. The um, think Especially highest... the core characters. I think the highest compliment I can give them to how they reworked the characters is that I was very lukewarm on Eris to maybe even disliked her in the original version, and I quite enjoy her now. Yeah, I liked her. Um, yeah, she's an interesting character. Um, basically, for those... How many playthroughs have you done in this game, Hunter? Is it just the one? Just the one, yeah. Um, I've done the same, but I have, I've done that thing where I was like, I'm not going to go for the Platinum. I won't do it. And then I was just like, oh, I'll just do all the, I'll just, because I got all the collectibles, I got all the music discs. I was like, oh, I'll just, I'll just do these bits and bobs. And I'll, I'll go get all the dresses and I'll just leave hard mode for another time to the point where I've literally played it enough that I've now seen Eris seen by accident as well in chapter 14. Oh, and I've nice. got like all the dresses. And the only thing I haven't done in this game is beaten it on hard mode and got the four trophies that are related to the hard mode. So that's all I haven't done. <laughs> but yeah, I watched that scene with Aerith and I wasn't... It's kind of hard to like a character like her because of what you know happens to her. If you haven't played the game before, See, the it's thing. kind of hard it's to like get attached to, like to her, her. In spite of that. Yeah, and I still felt like... I still and I still felt attached to her. Like, I still really liked her by the end of it. And she, she's my least favorite out of the base four oh, here's, that we here's have. Here's something I want to bring up. I mentioned earlier that I think Sephiroth knows like the um nature of the shenanigans going on as far as him yeah. being do you think eris does she has yes. that aura about her that she's like mm-hmm. she oh. specific yeah there was there was definitely her whole scene where she's made of i what i assume the hologram mako projection that she pulled off oh, yeah. uh, during that cloud scene just that whole um scene with the whether it's the don't get attached to me whether it's just the whole way the whole wording of that scene and how melancholy that scene is it it feels like for example cloud's like we're coming for you or whatever he said he very much he specifically says to her like oh yeah, we're coming to get you and she she can't she, she already, it's as if she already knows yeah she's already she's like if that's what you want to do then thank you it's like it, everything that I've seen from Aerith makes me believe that she knows what's going on. Yeah. She's the only one that could originally see the whispers. That's true. And she, besides when until they she, yeah, she, cloud. 
She's yeah, until she to touched Cloud, yeah, she was the only one that could see them, which to me suggests that she kind of knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Which and is I would, I, yeah, I, she, she also has that very specific line where she's like, everyone dies eventually. Yeah. And which I it's think just saying that... a new interesting layer to her character that wasn't there before, clearly, because of the, you know, lack of fate thing, but her being like having to face this issue the whole time is interesting i think it would be very interesting and also i think it would again it would appeal to those fans that already know it what the fate of Aerith. for the people that already know what the fate of Aerith is but don't know the rest of the game i think it'd be very interesting to have her as a character also know yeah um as if she knows that she's on a timer in a way like she's only got so much to make an impact so much so much time to make an impact um and that she isn't the full like she isn't the full story this is kind of she has to take what am i trying to say she's essentially she knows that she's only she's a small piece in a larger puzzle that she's only one step of this and she's got to basically do her part but then it's up to them um kind of like dr strange and endgame in a way like she's already seen the future and she already knows the sacrifices but she has to keep playing to the part of it because if she changes if she tries to change what's in the next part she's just gonna hold up the one finger to herself exactly it would be very funny if in the next part when she is supposed to go if it doesn't happen and she's like this is wrong Like this stuff is supposed to happen I've right now, and it's not happening since before the game came out. That I want them to move that around just to screw with people, and now I think that's a <laughs> has a way higher chance of happening. Because mm-hmm. you just you'd expect that if it was to happen, it would happen in the next game if it was in the original plays. Yeah. So, and would they do that? I've said this: if they are actually going to keep it, and they are actually going to get rid of it, it will be the end of the, it. Will be that will be the cliffhanger of the game. Yeah. As it was in the original version, it was the end of and the, the original disc. disc. But at the same time, it again, it's one of those things of how much are they going to expand the bit between that and her death now? And then it's like, does it fit well? What do they not want to have it? Do they think, oh, that's going to be obvious? That's going to be an obvious ending to one of the parts. Let's not do that. Let's change that and do something else. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Um, let's talk about the other members of uh, Avalanche and their team. Let's start off with. Um, let's start off with the main three that we haven't talked about. We talked a little bit about Aerith. Um, I just want to give a shout out that Barrett is my favorite character in this game by a long Barrett margin. Is great, he's, he's an incredible, great motivations, yeah. and he's very grounded in his his affection for his daughter is what grounds him in a lot of ways. It's honestly, it was in, it was really well done. Like honestly, it was just. He's he's over the top and camp at times in terms of like his performance, um, but then when he needs to get serious and he needs to get down to earth and he needs to like have a one on one, he really does that and it's really great. And I was when I saw when I played the original demo and I saw him in the first chapter and he's very much this. Let me give you a speech, um, Mister T, essentially <laughs> yeah. charging. Don't give one. You're kind of like, oh, this this guy might get old. This might be a ster- like a stereotypical character, but by the time you get through it, and especially what they just did with all of the scenes, and then the fall of Sector Seven, and you have that whole moment where he kind of just has a breakdown, and then he finds out his daughter's still alive. Like that was all really well done. That was all extremely well done. Dude just lost his whole team, as far as he knew, and thought he lost his daughter, and he just had to keep going. He kind of just, yeah, he just kind of has to push it. And it's also, that's probably one of my favorite cloud moments as well, is in that entire chapter, in chapter 13, in that entire chapter where they're going to try and find Marlene and stuff like that, Cloud just has a complete personality shift, even from later in the game when he's going to rescue Aerith and all that, where he just, he does, he just stops cutting the bullshit with Barrett completely. Yeah. And he's like, just focus we'll go in there just come on let's do this he just has a complete toe and that's why if we're moving on to cloud that's why i also loved this interpretation of cloud because i've never really been a big cloud fan from everything that i've seen i'm just like oh look he's an edgy emo boy and then i've heard his voice in kingdom hearts i'm like yeah he was really good in the first in the original game and then he became this flanderization of himself later on and they brought it back to being him just being kind of a jerk rather than this uh yeah um 
edgy, you know, moody person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll cost you is like his catchphrase in the game. Towards the end when they're talking about rebuilding the bar and he says that, I'm like, oh, that was funny. Yeah, you could. It was it was one of those lines where it's like you can tell it was a joke, um, and but it was still yeah, it's pretty um, great. But I really did like what they did with Cloud in this game. Yeah, just the tonal shifts. Like it was unlike other Square Enix games, where most of the time I'm like these are either really great performances but one tone characters, or these performances are just awful. That's the two Square Enix kind of. <laughs> voice acting tropes with these characters they did genuinely did a good job of having fleshed out characters that did a good job on their performance even if it wasn't motion captured which is what i find extremely impressive is you can tell just from the shift in cloud's voice how he's feeling and you can see that he's not just a monotone like emo miserable like moody teen kind of archetype he is very much is caring and you can tell when he's genuinely upset and when what's happening is bothering him or when he's you can tell when he's slightly liking things and he makes jokes and it's it's really well done i I don't know who voices him but uh, yeah very well done either but it was a good job his dynamic with every each of the other three is really good Mm -hmm. it feels unique to one another as well yeah um and then finally tifa i'll give a shout out to tifa i really like tifa in this game as well yeah Tifa very good job pretty great um i couldn't find out who the, when i looked up the voice actress as well i couldn't find anything that i knew her from so yeah. so i was like that's a really good job <laughs> especially for someone that job, isn't that well known a lot of these i was recognizing voice actors here there and everywhere yeah. like people would just whisper and i was like it's Anne. <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> they were like uh <laughs> Shinra was the main villain of metal gear solid 5 <laughs> Oh, was he? Yeah. I wouldn't have gotten that one. Yeah. Um, and then Johnny was Yuri Lomafor, who we... Johnny, man, what a character. I really hope that he is the new kind of reoccurring character in the remake. I really exactly. hope that he just shows up everywhere. Each each part needs to have a Johnny Experience trophy now. I just want to throw that one out there. Like Each one needs to have a following story of Johnny. It was... Um, to really bring good back to them. Tifa real quick because we kind yeah, of yeah go for it I was going to do it anyway and moved on for a minute uh, yeah I was going to bring it back but yeah go on like the uh, she was kind of like the most conflicted of the group as far as what they were doing she felt the consequences of their actions the most were too great yeah I thought that was I thought that was a good move because in the original game a lot of times it was like oh things blow up shrug of the shoulders <laughs> on to the next mission from everyone yeah. mm-hmm I agree. She definitely was. She's my favorite just because I really just, I really liked her performance and I really liked her relationship with every character. Yeah. Like I really, whether it was the really cute chemistry between her and Cloud, where you can see that they have that relationship that's kind of was there and then it's gone. It's been away for such a long time. And it's these two kind of coming back together as friends and learning who they are now. Cause they're very much different from when they were before, um, like a decade prior or something ridiculous. How long it was it's been? Like five years. She'd been living there for five years, at least. I know that. Yeah. In Sector 7, however long it was, but a long time. And then, or whether it was that kind of, again, it was that kind of that fatherly relationship with Barrett in a way, where she very much was, Barrett was always the one to bring her up in a way when she was feeling down. And you could tell that they had a real strong sense of trust with each other, whether it was her looking after Marlene when they're at the bar or other things like that. And then just her, I loved her chemistry with Aerith. Oh, it was yeah. something re- it was just that it was, was a nice friendship it was pretty great it was yeah it especially i love yeah, beating yeah. the snot out of corneo's dudes that scene chapter nine we'll get to chapter nine because i was gonna ask you, you know. in a bit about favorite chapters but um yeah just that scene in general and then you've got the sewers the sewer section as well oh yeah um which was interesting. I got a glitch in the sewer section where, you know, when you have to turn the lights on in that room and you all look at the power like lever for a bit. Yeah. I had a glitch where obviously like the string of code where they all just go and look at the thing just stayed permanent. So I was going through the whole sewers and I just looked behind me and Tifa and Aerith were running back towards that blooming lever, that, that lever the whole time, <laughs> the entire chapter. So oh. I was like, oh, that's a bit awkward. And then they'd respawn back with me when a fight starts and then they'd run off again. And even I was like, oh, 
the path's blocked now. There's no way that the collision, and they were still trying. They were just trying to run into the water. Like they were like, oh, that's hilarious. Get to the lever, but no. Um, I did. I really like any like weird broken things like that. That was the only one. That was the only one that I got. Yeah, and it was in chapter ten. Yeah, it was chapter ten. ten. That's yeah. the only one I got in the entire game. But no, characters were done really well. Shouts to some of the smaller characters in it. Like I say, J- Johnny. They did a really good job great character. making all of the avalanche people actually feel. Oh, yeah, we should talk about the avalanche people. I really liked all of them. Yeah, I liked um, them too. We should talk about the ending of those characters as well, which I think is extremely interesting, and it's another one of those places. Uh, Biggs is still alive for one. Yeah. Confirmed alive, which yeah. is weird. Uh, um, I don't. Uh, Wedge, I was, I was, I, that was. I don't know. He got pushed out. Wedge, window, you hear but... that he gets pushed out window, but he doesn't. The other two are off screen, and I said to you, Hunter, if they're off screen, I won't believe it until I fully see it. Yeah. And after seeing the little spoiler that I had, um, and double checking, those are definitely Jesse's gloves on the table. At the it, end. Does this happen at the same point where you like? See it's at Biggs. Yeah, it fa- yeah. So you see Biggs in the bed, and then it fades, and then it pr- and then it pans over. You don't see the other half of the room. You just see him Biggs in a bed, and then it pans over to the window where on the dresser you have her gloves and her uh, headband as well. See, I must I do focus on the fact that Biggs was alive, and also my head was spinning from the rest of the game and the hard right turn it took in the madness throughout the time to pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. And- but. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see the fate of those characters, because um, I liked them. That's the thing; they did turn these characters that were basically just not really important in the original at yeah. all. They just kind it's of one kind and done characters. There. And if you had, if you were at all familiar with any kind of story with dramatic tension, you knew that they were going to die. Mm-hmm. So, so I think again, it would be very interesting, especially with this defying fate, if they did turn these. Uh, basically one-tone characters that weren't very important in the original that died into these characters that somehow did survive, and who knows what will happen with them. Because I believe, isn't isn't there a part in the game where you do go back eventually? uh, To Midgar? Yeah, you go to the Shimmer building, don't you? Uh, You could if you wanted to, but I don't know if there's any point. I assume that we will eventually go back to Shinra at some point, especially with how they introduce the President's Son and all that. I think that... Oh yeah, Rufus. Rufus. I think there will be a point where Shinra, you'll go back to Shinra at some point. Uh, well, in the original game, Shinra is just this kind of persistent, annoying force throughout. Ah, uh, yeah. Time. It's like, if, you know, for all of Midgar, they were like the main threat, but they kind of slowly get phased out as Sephiroth starts uh, takes prominence. doing his yeah. thing. But again, it was one of those things where at the end, it didn't feel like they stopped being a threat. Yeah, at the end of remake, it just kind of they showed all the board members there, and they showed this new president. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with Shimra. Um, I'm just trying to think of anything else that I wanted to mention character-wise, or if we should just move on to favorite moments. Uh, can you think of any uh, other than yeah? Every character was done really well, even um, some of the the minor ones like yeah. whoever uh, Anne's voice actor played was. <laughs> who was in it for two yeah, seconds remember so it's quite funny. played the character i can't remember the name of uh yeah oh i did want to give a shout out because we did just we did mention biggs and wedge biggs and wedge but i really like jesse as well jesse was probably my favorite of the bunch as far as which yeah. i think was they were the that was the one who got the most attention mm-hmm. yeah which again makes me yeah she could be dead. She could be alive. We'll see. I'm not going to talk about it more than they they've could. left. They literally, they obviously want you to think about it because they put her yeah. clo- pieces of clothing on a table. So yeah. <laughs> they want you to think about it. If they could but... be alive and then get brutally murdered in the next part for some reason. Mm-hmm. Like... You never know. Fate might come back and call them. They might need them for something else and then they die during that. Who knows? Mm. But yeah, so that was that. Hunter, what would you say are your favorite moments from okay, this so game. the whole uh, plate dropping sequence was mm. bananas. The climb in the tower. Yeah, that whole part was. It felt real tense. Yeah, it was really well done. Yeah. Um, I did like how you were very much climbing this tower for a good deal. Sorry, kind of out of breath. Don't know why. <laughs> um, but uh, I really liked how you would just climb this tower and then you'd 
you'd find Biggs and then you'd climb more and then you'd find Jesse and then you got to the top and you found Barrett and Barrett's just <laughs> being Barrett at the top. Yeah, just literally just shooting the helicopter. the helicopter, man. And... As you casually do. Um, and then that just that whole se- sequence with the... Uh, I can't remember. What are the guys called again? I know the, the Turks, that's it, with the Turks. Reno. Uh, with Pitbull and uh, Reno. Did, um, yeah. You know, I like that they were feeling a little conflicted about doing it too. Shows that they're not like just evil robots. Mm-hmm. And I do have to give a shout out because I'm not really going to mention chapter eight in my favorite moments, but the fight with uh, Pitbull when his glasses oh, yeah. smash. Oh yeah. And instead of saying cool. anything, he just pulls it. He just takes the pair of glasses and chucks them to the floor and then picks up a new pair of glasses out of his pocket and puts them on. Dude, is Reno a great rude or some of my favorite, like uh antagonists. Rude. That's his name. People. Yeah. Yeah. Or... Also Reno's fight was really fun. So shout outs to that one. Um, It was a really good fight in the church. So yeah, like that. But now I really did like, um, the plate falling down sequence um it was just it was really tense and it was really fun and it kind of as as stupid as it sounds and as sad as it is that sector seven obviously collapses it was a very fun cut scene to watch them zip line down that whole thing with the explosions going everywhere it was very like it was one of the most over the top moments out of the entire game and it was it was pretty great i liked it a lot yeah uh um my favorite section which I spoke to you a little bit about was chapter nine by far. Chapter um, nine was great. Wall market is my favorite part of that game. Um, whether it's just the side quests or just the whole story around it, I just I really love that entire chapter. Respect. Um, there was so much. Yeah. Nods to different things too. Oh, there was there was so much, dude. It was so much fun just going around uh, talking to the three. Um, what were they? titles i don't even remember i i know the names of the characters there's adam m yeah. there's uh there's the chocobo sam guy and chocobo then there sam, is madam m uh, uh god what's his name from uh is it andrea andrea that's it right andrea radea of the uh gosh honey bee in. The honeybee in uh, which i have to give a shout out to the honeybee in uh, music it's incredible whoever oh, made that song i uh, will talk about music in general in this game later <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah but no that the entirety of chapter nine when it's from you know you see tifa for the first time and she's going in and then you have to kind of do some reconnaissance work um to try and get someone to promote you and then you have uh the coliseum fights which i loved the coliseum Dude, it was really so good good the addition the bandits that you encountered on the way there Oh, the bandits, dude. The, the unsung heroes of the game. The bandits oh. who show up, like, up to four times in this game, if you Fantastic. can find them enough. Uh, yeah, I love the bandits, um, and I just love that entire section. And then you have the, the branching side quests was something that I found extremely annoying from a wanting-to-do-every-side-quest perspective. Um, but it was something just really interesting that they didn't need to do, but yeah, I appreciated that they did. It could have been just one, and, like, it was only... I'm pretty sure there was only one way to do it in the original version. Mm-hmm. So them going out of their way to make like different things that could happen is interesting. Yeah, I really yeah. Uh, shout outs to the uh, the squats mini game, which was hilarious. I really liked that. Uh, and then the side quests, all this all the side quests are pretty decent in that uh, chapter, especially the one where you're going around with Johnny. Oh yeah. Uh, dude. Where it starts off as just the most mundane task ever. I was like, this is going to be a really boring side quest. When you go to the clothes shop, guy's like, "Oh yeah, can you go get my dad from the bar next door?" And you're like, "Yeah, sure." And then just Johnny comes and he's like, "I'll help you." And then he runs around going from door to door, and you end up going on this mad goose That's chase for this random. Joke. I thought that was gonna be like a uh, run to place, like maybe like two locations, and then be done. And then it just kept going. I'm like, man, this side quest is long. <laughs> yeah, and then you just it's just you and Johnny hanging out, going from place to place to end up getting a honeybee and VIP card. Um, and then you have that hilarious scene where the um, the old man's like, "Yes, I've got my inspiration back." Oh man! And Johnny's like, "I'm gonna go help him and see what his inspiration is, so I can help you, bro." And it's like, "Oh, it's the it's incredible." Um, I loved that. And then just the whole honeybee in segment of that game is yeah. incredible. It was when, crazy. I loved it. The dance scene, although. To be honest, if you're gonna make a rhythm game, Namora, make it so that it's on the actual beat. I yeah, don't know why this one wasn't. Music. 
Yeah. <laughs> but no, that whole section when you if you're not focusing on the the button presses that accurately and you're just watching it, it's a sight to be seen. It's incredible. I love how Aerith is a hundred percent into it. She's into <laughs> it a bit too much. That's incredible as well. It is. Um and then they turned what was a, a very awkward kind of Japanese kind of thing to do, which was just having a cross dressing character and kind of making a joke out of it into a be who you want to be scenario kind of thing, which was like, I was, I was like, did they actually just try and make that a be proud of who you are cloud moment? I was like, that's great. Uh, dude. I absolutely that, love it. That is funny. And, and you know, if they had kept it like it was in the original, that probably would have gotten some, people to raise their eyebrows like oh mm-hmm. that won't fly today don't be like this i just want to yeah i want to give a shout out uh, to square enix because that's how it's done atlas if you're like if you're watching how square enix did that that's how you do it and not make it disrespectful unlike the gay characters that are in persona 5 which is my one thing that i don't like about that game it's just how they did that and it just wasn't cool whereas this is the turned it into an actual like positive message in a way which was i really liked it was yeah. it was just it was just very funny because i was expecting i was ex- that was the point where i was like oh here's where we go all japanese and everyone laughs at him and no andre is like you need to be who you are on the inside you know it's like yeah. turned into a real like moment and then you have the whole thing with uh you go in and the whole dress thing and how he always picks cloud now is hilarious yeah. um and you just have Cloud sitting at the edge of the bed while he's trying to dirty talk him and he's just like, shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. And that whole scene with Ar- Aerith and Tifa and just that whole section. It's really well done. I love that entire moment. Oh. It's probably my favorite part of the game. Corneo is such far. a sleazeball too. He does it perfectly. He makes you feel dirty. Did He makes yeah, you feel dirty just looking, looking at him. him makes you feel like you've got some grime just on your skin somewhere. Hmm. It's not great. The fact that he's still out there makes me concerned. Uh, yeah. We'll see him again, unfortunately. Um, go on then, Hunter. You you take the, what do you want to talk about real quick? Um, I don't know. We haven't actually talked about the combat at all. <laughs> oh, sure. Let's talk about that. Uh, so they've been trying to implement a stagger mechanic into Final Fantasy games since 13. So it's been mm-hmm. a solid decade of them trying, and it took until now for it to finally, you know, come across well. Yeah, it re- works really well. Yeah. Like, this feels, in a lot of ways, this feels like a Western RPG with, like, a cool Final Fantasy system over top of it with the materia, as far as gameplay goes. It feels like what they wanted to do with Kingdom Hearts yeah. for the longest time. If they, it's it's kind of like, to me, it's they're imagining what if we may, wanted to do a combat system that was kind of like a heavy kind of Kingdom Hearts style where it wasn't aerial it, as such. It was more of a on the ground. And I want to give a shout out to whoever came up with the idea of converting the ATB system into this slow-mo quick time kind of menu of doing certain moves oh, and yeah, styles while you're playing it fantastic. it is not only is it the most stylish like menu i've ever seen where everything just freezes time and you can still move the camera if you want to and everything like that it's real cool. um but it also it's it's something the way i never have it's kind of that persona mentality when it's like i never have i felt menus be so satisfying um and combat be so satisfying when it's stylish like that it's just it feels so good unlike kingdom hearts when you're just mashing quick like the l1 and x just to like the quick menu to try and get a busted move out you can do that in this game they still have the quick menu you can still hold l1 in combat and have a quick menu i didn't but use it, it just, i never used it because it was, i it found was myself just using so it with Tifa because i felt like she was kind of yeah yeah that a little bit but with like Mary. but there was something so there was something so satisfying about freezing time and just having this moment to think and just go okay what do i want to do what's the best course of action here how many gauges do i have okay i've got this much to work with let's see what we can do and it was just it's so satisfying in the combat system I also thought the balance and, of uh, how often you were getting the ATB was done pretty well. Like I never felt like I was. It was done really well because it's, it's. I never felt. It's one of those things that you, like wrong. you said, you never, yeah, you never, you never noticed it until you. I never even know thought about it until you just mentioned it. It's perfectly balanced where you don't think you're getting it too quickly, um, and it's not. It doesn't take forever because I never even thought about. Oh, hurry up! 
Like, so, yeah. like when they when I would get like a ATB up materia or whatever or whatever it was that would boost it, I was like, I don't even really feel like I need to use this. So I would just give it to like Barrett or Tifa that way when I needed them to be able to do something because they weren't getting it as fast. I would have them mm-hmm. up ready. Which also shout outs to the materia system in this game as well. Also really well done. I really yeah. liked the materia system in this game. Um, I feel yeah, like it, it works adds, really it well, and it has this air to things that a lot of like other RPGs just feel missing in a way. Like it always feels like there's something to progress towards as far as making your stuff better. Mm-hmm. I like how I liked how it kind of took away the other than Aerith, who is obviously more of a long range slash healer type. It it took away because for the majority of this game, for the vast majority of it, your party is something composing of either. Uh, Tifa, it's always Tifa and Cloud. For the majority of the game, it's always Tifa and Cloud, and then it's either having Barrett or having Aerith with you. Yeah. Um, for the most part. And Barrett's more common than Aerith. Aerith's the least playable character in this game by far. Yeah. Um, it was really nice to have it be that the leveling up of the abilities was on the materia, so you can always kind of change. You're no longer locked into, like in Persona 5, you're not like, Morgana's my healer because that's what he's built to do. That's how I've built him up. That's whatever. It's no longer that. It's, I have the healing materia and I've leveled them up and it's like, okay, I have these people and in this fight, I think Barrett's going to be the least of you, so let's stick the healing materia on him so we can use his ATB stuff to cure everyone during the game uh, during the fight and then tifa can be the close range and whatever you you have this extra dynamic where it's you're not kind of you're not really locked in anymore to what kind of skills in terms of the atb menu other than obviously weapon specifics with cloud and it also tifa. eliminates this level gap that would be present in a lot of older rpgs when you don't have characters around for certain points in time where suddenly they'd be like level you'd have like a level 14 and I believe characters are level scaled, are they not? Because uh, there's in, times in, in the this, game where like Aerith's gone yeah. for ages, yeah. Yeah. The, they level scale, but I think the material system also levels. helps with that as well because mm-hmm. you could always just switch around your high level stuff whenever mm-hmm. you need to. Like the game has a really good level system as well where it's not used in the sense of limiting progression. I hate when level systems are used just to limit progression, where it's like, oh, here's a bit of a roadblock for you. It, it genuinely... D- there was never a point in this game where I was looking at my level. Yeah. Then, it was just... I was just gaining... I was just gaining the bonuses of a level system, which is increasing your HP and stuff manually. It I was like just, like, giving you the bonuses. All of the weapons were also not necessarily better, but just a different way to do things. Oh yeah, you. Th- they I think genuinely... with the exception of the spiked bat, I ignored that one. Yeah, I used it just for its proficiency. To I just used like the ability ten times, so I had the proficiency. Because the proficiency is pretty good on that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do the exact same, and I just loved. They kind of all followed a similar formula where you'd have one that was all in on an attack. You'd have one that was all in on magic. Then you'd have a couple that were balanced in between that would kind of, that had different play styles to them, and it was just it was a good mix of different weapons and weapon variety where you weren't always like you could find one that matched your play style but then it wasn't necessarily oh this one's over this one's busted i like noticeably busted i'm sure speed runners will be like actually this weapon if you unlock if you do this and this and this to it then it's the yeah, most busted thing in the game i'm sure but from a casual perspective there wasn't a time like in kingdom hearts when you're like oh this keyblade's obviously better than every other keyblade yeah it was very much a oh you know what I really like that big sword with the Japanese symbol those Japanese letters on it because it feels a crap ton of attack and you don't have much magic left but you can really do some damage with it and it's like and it's got it that cool nice. like spinning jump slash oh the spinning jump slash is great yeah. I loved that I loved all the special I liked the idea of proficiencies as well I want to oh, give yeah. a shout shout out to it... the fact that you... yeah go on because it gave you a reason to experiment with them. It didn't necessarily tie you down to using it forever, but it gave you a reason to try them. And it not only did that, it rewarded you for it because you were able to take the ability from that weapon and put it and use it with every other weapon. It was, it's that's like that's what I loved was the fact that you had all these unique abilities. But once you'd used, and also why I loved was it wasn't a use this ability a hundred times and you can use it. It was genuinely as simple as you use it ten times and you can just go to town with it. And that's it. It's yours now. You can use it with whatever combination of weapons and yeah. whatever you want. And I was like, that's great. And I wish more games did that. Because I hate when it's... You always have this 
dilemma in a lot of RPGs where it's like, well, I like the look of that weapon, but it's awful, but that weapon performs well, but I prefer the ability of this. Why can't I have it look like that and have that? And it's just like, yeah. we're fan of... With F7, obviously you can't change the customizations, but spoiler alert, all the weapons look really good. Yeah. Um, that's what they, they went for quality, not quantity with the weapon system. Each character only has six, but they all fit them to the point where you can't... Yeah, There's always that time where you're like, oh, that, that keyblade doesn't fit, or oh, that sword looks stupid, or whatever, but it was like, they all fit really well. And I really liked the weapon system. I couldn't fault the combat system in this game. There were, like, there were a couple of times where I'm like, this is a bit clunky, like, for example, in the Hell House fight, which... Oh, yeah, that thing... As cool as that thing was yeah. to see, its fight took me a little bit. I didn't it die, forever, but yeah, I felt like forever. I was fighting it forever. Because you could do very little damage to it, and then it was very much exploiting its weaknesses when it had a weakness. But yeah, that's times one like that. that uh, something I'd get random encounters of things that I had already fought before that were suddenly just harder, and I'd die, and I'd kill him again no problem but it, it wasn't like i needed to heal or anything because i didn't do that when i it was weird but occasionally i no, i actually agree where there were there were some fights where i agree where i did just die uh like i died in them like those but turtle jerks because of any i didn't feel like it was any fault of my own yeah i didn't think it was any fault of my own because as soon as i tried it and i didn't change my tactics at all the second time around and i passed it without even getting even nowhere near close to death so i was like that's weird yeah. Um, but you know, other than that, I can't really fault the combat system. I really enjoyed it, um, and I hope that they just take what they've learned from this and just build on it and improve yeah. it for the next game. Don't I I, I, I? I really hope they keep it. Please keep it. They probably will keep it. I I think the one thing that might be a little annoying in the next one is that they're probably going to make you start back at zero as far as like your materia and stuff. Oh yeah, I don't find I don't think there's going to be a way that they could very gracefully move you because there's some very busted stuff in that game. Like if you can start it with the uh, ATP, if you fully there's like the there's one that's like a ATP um, sh- like starter one where you can start the where you start the uh, encounter with a certain amount of ATB. And if you max that one out, you f- you basically have one and three quarter bars of ATB from the start. And I feel like. The game would be extremely busted if you could carry that over if into remake start two. Like that, that would. Be yeah, I think crazy. it would be extremely busted. But I hope that my one hope is even if I I hope that they, if it is a reset, then I, I'm obviously I'm going to be completely fine with that. But I hope that there are some like kind of things like hey, you can use some of the abilities from the start that you had in the previous game that we had. Yeah, like some of the abilities, like the, like the triple slash or the forward thrust or something like that. You know, like just because I imagine they'll probably set them back to their default weapons too, and you won't have the other five, which but... is a shame. Because Cloud um... is probably going to be swinging around the Buster Sword at the beginning rather than probably. Like the iron sword or the hard edge or any of those but i imagine mm-hmm. you might still have some of the abilities like the triple slash and such yeah i i hope they do that too where they just have they have certain abilities and stuff like that because you can't expect them to carry everything over especially if they want to make a load of new weapons as well yeah um for the next game i just really hope they don't just go let's put those same six weapons out in the world again and you no, have to go find them again. designs to pull from as far mm-hmm. as the original game is concerned so or bring the or if you want to bring the old weapons back bring them back but just bring them back early game yeah. like I, I it could be perfectly fine where the system the upgrade system for the weapons also is really good where all the old weapons you can upgrade the old weapons so they're just as powerful as the new weapons it, it genuinely is just a personal choice on which style of fighting the, the weapon provides you prefer yeah, so it wouldn't be like if they were like oh yeah here's six weapons it might be overwhelming for new people if they come into it with six weapons from the start but if they're all equal level then it's yeah. all just about the balance it's just they're all per- they're all balanced in my opinion so there wouldn't be any harm in it I agree um what have we not talked about? <laughs> All right. Because I especially forgot to do this when I was talking about it on the original, or on the first two times I talked about it on the podcast. The music in this game is great. It's incredible. Uh, absolutely. Like I, 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 At this point, as sad as it... I hate saying this, but 
in recent years, Square Enix actually developed games. I'm not talking about published games here, but in terms of the games that they make, in terms of Kingdom Hearts and stuff like that, usually the soundtrack's really great. Like the soundtrack, they usually do good soundtracks. If <laughs> even if the game's a bit shit, the soundtracks are usually really good. Like Kingdom Hearts three, they really nailed that soundtrack. Um, it's a bit samey, but yeah, still the nailed the aesthetic. Kingdom Hearts three is like the music was all really good, but none of it stuck with me. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about that credit song since I beat the game. Yeah, it's the really it's it was a really interesting pick of a credit song as well. Like, did, did you realize I, that it was like a vocal version of the uh, Sector Five slums? No, I didn't. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's like what it is. I, nah, was I didn't realize it. The soundtrack before, and I heard that. I'm like, oh wait a minute. That's the, when I got to the Sector Five slums. I was like, oh, that's the credit music. Ah, uh, no. I, I've been playing through Sector 5 like at least twice to try and get these dresses. So, so. Yeah. Didn't notice it now, but no. The music's really great. And I mean really great. Um, I don't know how they managed to make tw- like 20 odd different versions of the Final Fantasy VII battle theme and not make it get old, but they somehow did it. It's bananas that they made so many versions and made it work so well. Other favorites of mine include like the bike chase, the first bike chase song. Oh, really can good. I just get, yeah, I want to give a shout out to the piece of music that plays when you get the Jesse result screen at the end of that as well. Oh, it's yeah. a really short piece of music, but there's just something about that piece of music that's so good. Like, it just fits that scene perfectly and it kind of fits Jesse as a character and I really liked it. So shout outs to that piece of music as well. Oh, we got to talk about that quickly. Got to talk about that section. The fucking, the guy on the, mo- the soldier on the right. motorcycle... Where that whole section game? was incredible as well. I just I want to say him. that. I, I loved I that. I hope he comes back in the next part. It oh. was the most anime part of the entire game where the guy was the starting doing backflips on the motorcycle and landing it perfectly and stuff like that. Like, I loved that. Shout outs to that. That was really great. But no, uh, other pieces of music that I really liked were both of the sol- both of the slums themes that they used were great. Yeah, the, slums, were- the Sector 7 slums is like a prettied up modernized version of like the overworld theme from the first game i thought that was really mm. good uh, yeah the uh i really liked how the way that they brought the old music to a newer time i could detect yeah. a lot of it in a bunch of ways and i was like oh i hear you that's good um yeah uh what else was pretty great in this Aris's soundtrack. theme is a classic mm-hmm. uh, that was pretty great um i loved the the war market music was great i loved the war market music it fit that whole area perfectly like really well done the music in chapter nine at the start of chapter nine when you're walking to the tunnel with Aerith, there's that piece of music and it's kind of somber in tone and it's really quiet but it's for how short of a time it plays it genuinely you only hear it for about a minute to two minutes and you hear it in the background of the cutscene, so I don't really count that because you're too busy concentrating on what's been said. But that piece of music is incredible, like super good. I really loved it. Um, shout outs to the version of the battle theme that's played while you're doing the workout mini games. That's incredible. Whoever decided uh, let's do an '80s uh, workout uh, remix, it's great. Thumbs out. Um, uh, the honeybee in music is great. Whoever decided to make that kind of redo re done version in a more modern dance kind of um tone really well done i loved it the airbuster boss music was good because you notice that that one was different than how all the other boss fights up to that point were just different versions of the main battle theme mm-hmm. airbuster yeah. song was like the original boss music oh was it yeah that's a nice, that's and, then nice it was, and then they made like four phases to it and it was just bananas i love that i mean that. We've got to give a shout out just because we have to to the Sephiroth boss music oh, yeah. as always. Their version of One Winged Angel was something. Honestly, there was a massive smile on my face because obviously I'm not a big fan of Fantasy Fan and I never even heard Sephiroth's theme before. Not even in Kingdom Hearts really because I'd never did any of this secret bosses. So when I heard them chanting Sephiroth in the oh, background yes, and I, my ears just picked up on it, I, I, I five minutes I get that too. Yeah, like, my smile just like peaked instantly. The other it was great. And then finally you got the Sephiroth. Oh, yeah, Sephiroth. 
I was like, yep. oh, it's great. I love it. Part of me really wishes they would have shown a little bit of restraint and maybe not had you fight Sephiroth at the end and make the uh, fight against the incarnations of fate or whatever just a little bit better. But, yeah. you know, I'll say that the fight itself was super hype. I just think that it probably would have been for the best if they had left it alone. Yeah, I, I did enjoy the bus fight, though. It was, it was fun, and it was also... It was challenging, but it wasn't BS challenging, which a lot of Square Enix games tend to do nowadays. Well, oh, yeah. Tend to do recently, where the final boss just has a massive learning curve where it's just instantly harder than everything else in the game. And it like, just he hits you with the back. move that sends you down to one HP, and he could just immediately smack you, but they're nice enough to not do that. Mm hmm. And it's just, it's it's a fun boss fight. And I loved the idea of it just building up. So it starts with just a one-on-one -on -one, and then Tifa gets into it. And then you have Barrett come in, guns blazing, because of course he does. Yeah. And then you just have that final moment where it's all, like, all five of them, including Red 13, um, which was really cool. So yeah, shout outs to uh, that music. The, the Sephiroth boss music was really great. The whole soundtrack's really good. Yeah, like... This is the thing is like all of these songs stand out in some way to me as opposed to like, you know, like we said, with the Kingdom Hearts music was really good, but none of it like sticks with me in the way that this does. It's it's honestly it's going to be I've, I've, I've said this to you and Kyle, uh, it's going to be a sad day when I'm out of this period of playing game after game with absolutely incredible soundtracks and we just go back to a good soundtrack and, I'll, and the day I'll be disappointed by a good soundtrack. You were just going to get to the last Royal ones too, into, where it's just yeah. sad acoustic guitar, which is oh, really but good for what is, it does. Oh, but it's, it's beautiful, though. Like that's the thing with the Last of Us music is I can respect the Last of Us music just because of how beautiful it is. Like yeah. it's such a contrast to the actual game when, in a way, because just Gustavo, whoever I think his name's Gustavo, who um, makes the music, is it's just the way it just it's so somber and it's so soft compared to really what the actual good, game is. Honestly. It's just it's a really good contrast. But no. Uh, would recommend the music um how, what did you think of the whole lab section at the end of the game and uh, that was that felt like it could have been shorter thank you i'm glad that you agree that's that was my one takeaway was did it really need to be four areas yeah this thing just felt like it just dragged it and dragged like and shorter like it ended pretty cool but um i, I assume hojo was gonna play a bigger part later as well oh, yeah. i assume you know how corneo makes you feel dirty hoseball or hojo is also a sleazeball i hate him <laughs> i want to give a shout out to whoever made the model for him because they did like a really good job of making me hate him just from the way he expresses i know like, it's, it's the worst it's the jawline it's the jawline and the kind of like T like the tight skin around like his neck and his cheek area that just it's like makes him look really sneering yeah evil and it's he kind of gives me in a way and then maybe it's just because they both are the kind of mad scientist archetype but he kind of gives me like it's the kind of vexen's creepy uncle from kingdom hearts he's oh, just like he's even God. more sick and twisted dude like it's i, I definitely love it. hate hojo more <laughs> Oh, I love Vexen. Let's get, let, let me get. I love Vexen. Whereas, yeah, Hojo, I hated him. Like yeah. he's, he just, he is. He, I, I, I can't wait to see where he goes because it was just, it was a really interesting character and how he just doesn't care about the entirety of Shinra. Um, Shinra experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I liked him. Uh, just it was very weird having all of the members of Shinra Court be there and. None of them are really elaborated on much other than Heidinger. Is it Heidinger? Is that his name? Uh, Heidegger, yeah. Yeah, Heidegger. That guy. Um, He's like the warmonger I, person. I, oh, God. There was, a, there was a part of me that was like, I kind of felt mixed about him. Um, he, was, he, was, he was definitely the most Square Enix character out of all of them. He was very um, cartoonishly evil. Where he was cartoonishly evil, where he does like that, like that laugh during the chapter five is it? oh i can't remember what chapter five or six. yeah chapter five yeah five or six it's one of those or is it seven uh actually it might be seven right well, you're in the tunnels so. uh, yeah yeah but he has like that maniacal laugh that he does like the evil villain laugh and i'm just like oh god here we go like he's the he's the, he's kind of he was a bit kind of cartoony for me but you know 
President Shinra was also... Like, was he the one with the gold-plated gun? Yeah, he had a gold gun at the end. I was <laughs> like, oh laugh. my god, they're giving him a gold gun. Also, I was like, why was Barrett scared of him? He's like, oh, no, I've got my gun. It's like, I've still got a cannon arm. Arm that is a yeah. gun. It was like, um, why are you scared of a pistol? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't get it, but that was funny. Um, but no. I kind of saw it coming at that stage. That was the one thing. I saw Sephiroth coming in at the end. As a... In the original version of the game, you just find President Shinra and he's been stabbed by Sephiroth's sword. <laughs> I, my favorite part of that whole cutscene is they had to come up with a ridiculous like camera angle because of how long Sephiroth's sword is. Oh, yeah. Like, Sephiroth's sword's that long that they kind of had to put President Shinra to the right side of the screen so that when they do kind of tilt it, you can just see Sephiroth in the background, like, five meters behind because that's how long his sword is. It's yes. just, like, it just made me laugh. One of the details towards the beginning of the game that I liked when Cloud was, like, what was it, Marco was that dude's name, where he was, like, thought he was Sephiroth and he was about to attack yeah. the sword got stuck in the archway. Oh yeah, yeah. That was funny. Um what was the deal with those guys? Were they failed like experiments? All right. So, the deal with those guys is kind of like uh essentially they have like Sephiroth's DNA or like Genova okay. in them and Sephiroth can kind of like control them in some kind of way. Mhm. And they were in the original but they didn't show up as early and he kind of used them as like little puppets to do things that he didn't feel like doing in person. Okay. Yeah. So that's what they kind of are. Cool. Because yeah. you have that guy where it's like, oh, well, you look out for him and then you never see him ever again. Yeah. Which just made me laugh. Um, who knows where he is now? Probably dead. He probably died in the rubble. Yeah, um, possibly. But no, it was just, those were kind of interesting. Uh, I'm just trying to think, is there anything else that I missed? Uh, what did you think of Chadley? Uh, uh, Mr. Battle and Tell himself, dude. He, um, well, his little, he, the purpose he serves as far as doing like battle intel and stuff was good. It's a good way to get new materia. Him being a little mm. robot that's selling you stuff is kind of funny. Is he a robot? I think so. Because I couldn't, I, I didn't get what he was at all. I was like, is he a I, robot? I, I is he a, like a just robot. a young he's child? Robot. Is he? he for some reason hates Shinra, even though he works for them. Do you know what I'm going to do? What's a favor? You keep talking, and I'm just gonna look him up real quick and see. Oh what yeah, so Chadley was is sad. funny. Did you, uh, after you got the dress for Cloud in Chapter Nine, did you just try talking to him? No. What does he say? He gets all flustered. Like he's like, "Oh, I don't know what feelings are. Please go away. I don't know how to process this." Because <laughs> like he he he's like uncomfortable that you're paying attention to him. <laughs> really, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Hang on. <laughs> uh, here yes. we go. Oh, here we go. In truth, Chadley is not a human, but a cyborg created and employed by Hojo to assist him with research. In spite of his programming, Chadley reworks himself to be free of Hojo's control and does so with Cloud's help. There you go. It's for the best, because Hojo is a scumbag. So yeah, he is a robot. Because I was always wondering, I was like, he's a bit young to be a researcher. Yeah. So there you go. Makes sense. But yeah, Chadley was interesting, and those battle intel reports were very interesting. They were either, gosh, this is a bit tedious, or oh, I've already done that, and it's all just automatically yeah, finished so for me because I, did it. I uh, yeah. didn't really go out of my way to do any of them, yeah. and I still ended up doing most of them. Like some of them, I'm like, oh, that's gonna take a while to finally happen, but you know, it, I did all of them. <laughs> Uh, and was it worth it? No, you kind of get you you kind of get a good a cool summon if you beat all of them. Oh, which um, summon? Oh gosh, I don't remember now. Oh, uh, let me look get, it up. I know you get Shiva, Fat Chocobo, and Ifrit all just on your own. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm really prepared. It was um, you get Leviathan for the for oh. one of the other black battle reports and then the one you get for beating all of them is bahamut oh t of course you get bahamut <laughs> go figure so, yeah. uh, whatever so, yeah. he's gonna show up in the next or one of the next games is something you just get anyway i imagine ah uh, yeah but there you go so you got bahamut for that 
and it was interesting. I never got to use him because I was done at that point. I was like, okay, cool. Maybe I'll use him in my hard difficulty playthrough. Yeah. Um, but no, that's about it. Hunter, was there anything that you didn't like about this game? Um, not like nothing that sticks out a whole lot. I also only mm. played through it once. Maybe I would feel like something's kind of drag when I play it again. But as of right now, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, same. Uh, I'm just trying like, to think. Like I said, that lab thing, section like... kind of dragged a little bit. but Yeah, the lab was something that dragged and I wasn't really a huge uh, fan of. Oh, actually, I've just remembered because uh, I can't think of anything negative to say um, right now. So I'm just going to say... I ask you this question. Did you take the stairs or did you take the elevator? Oh, I took the stairs, 100%. Uh, I did too. And it was honestly one of my favorite vid- video game moments in a while. The stairs is always the best answer because it's just hilarious. I just loved how it went to lens they didn't need to. Like, you had, obviously, you had the hilarious dialogue between Barrett, Tifa, and Cloud. I think they would have was... stopped the dialogue after, like, 50 floors, but they kept going. <laughs> which was incredible. Um, but not only that, but as you got it, it, the game made you slower the more you climbed, yeah, and no. the music started distorting itself in the background as you climbed as well because you were getting weak, so it was, the music was fading in and out. It's great. Uh, it's like your HP slowly started dropping, like when you got <laughs> to the last part. I love how in the bottom right hand corner there was like a there was like a number indicator telling you how many floors at which floor everyone was on, and that was just hilarious because you could just see those you could just see Barrett was. Just Go falling behind, and then Barrett catching up to you, and then Barrett overtaking you, and then you re overtaking him. Yeah, and then you all just sit at the top of the stairs for like five minutes out of breath, and it was, yeah, it was pretty great. I, I like that. Is the best choice. I think the elevator, I chose the elevator once in my many uh, mm-hmm. run throughs of Midgar as I attempted to play the original game. Um, basically, the elevator is faster, but you do a couple of fights in between. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not nearly as funny. Yeah. I went back and watched that moment. Um, and it's basically you just. The only thing you miss is you miss like a Tifa cutscene where someone gets into the elevator and it's just a regular Shimmer employee and they're calling their mum and just saying that everything's going to be okay and don't worry uh, about it. And then Tifa has one of those. Another one of those moments where she's like, oh, there's real people involved in this. Yeah. As well. It's not just people. And then Barrett makes one of his classic statements where he's like, oh, they've accepted the evil <laughs> or whatever. It's like they've still got sin or something because they accepted Shinra or whatever. But yeah, it was just one of those interesting scenes that you miss. Uh, hmm. yeah. Other than that, can you think of anything that we've missed? Um, no, I think we covered most of what we're talking about. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that... In particular, I feel that we've missed. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. I think we are good. So on that note, that has been our Final Fantasy VII Remake spoiler cast. A lot shorter than our previous spoiler cast. So hopefully That's everyone will actually be able to finish this one. Yeah. yeah. Everyone will be able to finish this one. Thank you yeah. so much for watching. What did you think about Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII Remake? Why don't you let us know? Uh, you can get in contact with us at YT on Twitter or just hit us up on the YouTube comment section. Uh, on that note, where can people find you, Hunter? YouTube.com slash ReaperHunter23. Nice. And you can find me uh, on YouTube.com slash WaterJames. But yeah, this has been our spoiler cast for Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, we usually upload every Monday, but this will be going out on a special day because we don't release spoiler casts on Mondays. So there you go. Um, so I don't know when this has come out. We're kind of early We're recording. Kind of like a, a little time chamber right now. <laughs> but yeah, you can expect spoiler cast to come out usually on a different date to the Mondays, but we do have regular episodes up every Monday at 5 p.m. Uh, British time, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. Yeah. Yes. And then you can work out everything else from that. We believe in you. Yeah. And you can find us on podcast services around the globe. If you don't mind leaving us a rating on iTunes and Google Play in particular, we'd really appreciate it. And on that note, that's been our show. So thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you next time for some more Hot Gamers Only. Until then, bye.